Good evening. It's a joy to welcome you to this session of the 2013 Hunger Symposium. It has been a delight of mine to watch this symposium unfold over the years that we have held it here at Wheaton. And it's a joy to be in the fellowship of learning with you uh, as we come together for this closing session this evening. I wonder if you would in, um, join me in an invocation as we think about the things that we will hear this evening. Please join me in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your creation. Thank you for your kind hand that guides the works of your creation, for the natural laws. We thank you for all of life that lives on this earth. We thank you for your maintenance of that life. We thank you for humankind that you've placed on this globe. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, who showed us how to live, who embodied humanness and yet was God, and through whose resurrection we have eternal life. Father, we thank you for those who are motivated by the Lord Jesus to have compassion for the rest of the world in their neighborhoods close and far. We thank you for that. We thank you for the ingenuity and the creativity of people who want to serve the kingdom of Christ and others who may not know you yet. We thank you for that compassion that is motivated by Christ to love and to, love and to serve one another. We come together tonight again commemorating the life and work of Paul and Margie Robinson who have served so diligently and well in our midst in leading this hunger program and serving in various roles on our campus. We thank you for that wellspring of inspiration that they've given us. We thank you for the footprints that they have left in our lives in Christian higher education and in Wheaton College. We thank you for their footprints that have surpassed our lives and covered many generations as we think of their work in our midst. We thank you that they were destined or ordained by you to come and serve with us and to inspire us. Lord, we pray for them especially this evening and ask that you would give them health, sustain their faithfulness, give them the presence of the power of your Holy Spirit to bring the healing of minds, hearts, and bodies we pray that you will continue to enable them as servants and that you will give them the strength that they need as they transition into new roles and into new places on this globe. Lord, as we think of the joy that we have as we come together in fellowship, as we experience the pain and suffering of those who are so less fortunate than we, we recommend ourselves to you and ask that your Spirit would work in us and enable us to follow you more diligently. We ask that you would bless this time this evening, that you would give us new uh, mental images, new compassion, and new commitments to those parts of the world that are so desperately in need of our help. So we commend this time to you with thanksgiving and joy in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the joys that I have as dean, as I mentioned as we started, is that of helping uh, faculty enable the development of programming and to help secure funding uh, to do certain projects. And there are many times, by the Lord's grace, that some of these uh, circumstances come together. And that was the case as we went to uh, and, and sought and at the same time, a gift was coming to us from the Deer Foundation. And there, is no, there are no words that express my joy in what that means to this program and to our students and faculty and staff here at Wheaton. And so uh, as we think about the impact of the Deer Foundation 
by providing an endowment to fund this type of interchange that we've had and exchange of ideas and stimulation of ideas that come to us from people who are professionals and are serving uh, in ways that we might not have imagined. We're very grateful to the Dear Foundation. And we've also been blessed by having Siri speak out with us. And Siri, I'd like for you to stand, if you would. And I'd like for you to please uh, give applause and thanks to her, to Carrie. Our message of appreciation back to the Dear Foundation. We're delighted for your participation in our event but also for the message that you'll care back and wish you well as you go back and share things and are also developing your career. It's been a joy to have you with us. I'd also like to ask uh, Paul and Margie to stand. We are delighted to have had you in this community for well over 13 years and to have you leading the program, Paul, in the ways that you've led this wonderful hunger program and we're thankful for your leadership uh, and the inspiration that you have brought uh, through a compassionate heart and by lending your expertise to the development of, of minds, hearts, and hands as we have moved forward. So, we're thankful for the footprint that you're leaving on us uh, that will enable us to go forward valiantly. So thank you very much. I'm very grateful as well to the staff of the Hunger Office, and I'd like for the staff to please stand, those who are here. And I'd like for us to... <laughs> applaud them and... Uh, I know, as most managers on this campus, that no manager makes it without the work of the staff who support them. And so we're very grateful for the extraordinary work that you do every single day uh, to support the work of the students and the faculty and the staff. I'm grateful for our faculty who have sponsored and mentored our students, and so I'm going to ask the faculty who are here who have sponsored or mentored uh, hunger interns to stand, if you would. And just a few of them are here, but many, many uh, faculty have served in these roles, and we're very, very grateful. And we're grateful for you students who've participated in these programs uh, with them, and many others uh, who have even returned for this hunger uh, symposium. This evening, we are especially blessed to have in our midst Dr. Gibessa Ijato, who was born and raised in a small rural community in West Central Ethiopia. He completed his early education in his native country, including a Bachelor of Science in Plant Sciences from Alamea College in 1973. He attended graduate school at Purdue University, earning his master's in 1977 and PhD in 1978 in plant breeding and genetics. In March 1979, Gibesson joined the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics in ICRISAT and conducted seminal sorghum research in Sudan for five years. In January of 1984, Dr. Ejeta returned to Purdue University as an assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy. Since then, he has led a comprehensive educational and research program at Purdue with emphasis on African agricultural research and development. He currently holds the position of Distinguished Professor of Plant Breeding and Genetics and International Agriculture at Purdue University. Now, I want to stop at this point in the introduction because as I think about his journey as a professional, I'm reminded of the journey of you students who are in our midst 
and the challenges that you've already met if you've been out on a hunger internship. Some of you have undertaken the intellectual challenge through courses in third world issues or other places. And many of you will develop uh, careers in uh, providing assistance like what our speaker tonight provides in terms of inspiring others, but also doing the hard work of uh, the sciences or other things that influence the two-thirds world. And so at this moment, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Robinson to come up because what we would like to do is to give the awards to the students whose hunger internships have won awards. And I think it's with the reminder of the trajectory that our speaker tonight has had that I feel inspired in such a way that perhaps some of you students will follow a similar pathway. And so um, I'm going to ask the students, as I call your name, to come up. And Dr. Robinson will uh, provide these uh, awards to the students. Number one is the uh, award that will go for the best example of weaving together reflection, immersion, and personal life application. Will Maxey, who is an anthropology major, who interned with the Holy Land Trust in Palestine. Is Will here. Second, the best research methods and presentation of application by Ernie Pine, an environmental science major. Aaron. Aaron. Aaron rather than Ernie, he interned with Food for the Hungry in Bolivia. She. <laughs> Third is the best example of usefulness of research for a host organization, Austin Schrag, a psychology major who interned with the Christian Action for Reconciliation and Social Assistance in Rwanda. Congratulations. Fourth, most thought-provoking and intriguing work in progress by Jared Netzel, an IDS major in anthropology and hunger. He interned with Pazi Esperanza in Bolivia. Thank you. Now, the reason I paused at this point is because I'd like for these students and other students who are here to remember that your training in the educational institutions that I've uh, mentioned about Dr. Ejeda is the kind of training that you're already on the track for. And the vision that you can have is what follows in his introduction. It's about thinking about the future and thinking about the future of others. And it means that you'll have opportunities to serve in extraordinary ways with organizations and um, moving in terms of using your expertise, whether it be science or something else, uh, to help the welfare of others. Professor Jatter has served on numerous science and program review boards and panels. He served on technical committees and advisor boards of major research and development organizations, including the International Agriculture Research Centers for IARCs, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and a number of national and regional organizations in Africa. He was a member of the team that launched the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, a joint effort of the Rockefeller and the Gates Foundation. Dr. Jetta served in the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, the largest publicly funded, the largest publicly funded agricultural research consortium in the world as a member of its Science Council, and he served there from 2008 to 2010. 
and he is currently a member of that consortium board. He is also a board member of the Saskawa Africa Program. Dr. Jetta was recently de designated Special Advisor to USAID Administrator Dr. Rajiv Shah. Dr. Jetta is a fellow in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow in the Crop Science Society of America, and a fellow in the American Society of Agronomy. Among his many awards, Dr. Jetta was the recipient of the 2009 World Food Prize and a National Medal of Honor from the President of Ethiopia. Would you join me in welcoming him uh, to share with us this evening? Thank you, Professor, for that kind introduction. Uh, maybe first of all, I'd like to express my thanks for those who were involved in inviting me to come and give this talk. Uh, Dr. Page, uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, Chris, for your assistance and patience in working with my schedule and getting me here. And then um, an even bigger expression of gratitude for all that you do as faculty and students and uh, a program uh, to have had the foresight uh, for a small Christian college to start a program on hunger that early in the lives in the time of crisis in the developing countries. Uh, but the timing of that coincided with the big hunger in my country, and that was about the time that I left the country. And then to have had the fortitude to sustain it for as long as you have. And long before the agenda of food security and hunger was topical in the country, and long before even a study abroad was really a fad in the country. And so I applaud you for what you've done. I, I cheer you and I encourage you to continue to do this because the number of students that have received this experience over the last 37 years is incredibly large. And that is an incredible legacy for a college to have and uh, the impact of those that are already have had a great success and great career and then those that would continue to do that in terms of service to humanity. I assure you in my book, there isn't anything bigger or better than that. Thank you very much. The, the title <clears throat> that I chose for my talk is, Is Science and Technology Sufficient to Empower Small-Scale Farmers to Feed the Hungry? And the answer is simple. Um, but I would like for us to walk through my thought process on why a response for that question is necessary. I go around and talk on food security agenda because one of the jobs I have at Purdue is to serve as the executive director of a newly created Center for Global Food Security. And as such, um, this has become my charge. And I really truly believe that the struggle to reduce hunger and poverty and the food security agenda has truly become the foremost challenge for humanity in this 21st century. While it's not a great testimony for humanity at large, with all the know-how and knowledge and technology that we have, with all the resources that we have around us, that we continue to have hunger and poverty around the world is not a great legacy to be proud of. But yet, now with the newly renewed global food security agenda, that as we know that we're all in it together and that addressing this agenda is not only a, an agenda for the poor, but an agenda for humanity at large. The basic problem 
of food security is really the impetus starts with an exponentially growing global population. The world population has grown, um, and much of that growth that this graph would show is coming from the developing countries. The, when you look at that graph, the deep orange color shows the growth in population in the developed world, which has really leveled off. It is a population of developing countries that is continually growing such that the headlines today tell us in 2011, October last year, the declaration was made that the world population has now grown to be 7 billion. The projection is by 2050, it would come to about 9.5 billion people. That's a nearly, an increase of nearly 40%, 30 some, some percent increase in population growth. So there would be a commensurate growth in increase in food demand. But there is something additional, that in some of the areas of the world where the economy is growing at a rapid rate, then those people, their diet would change, the so-called BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and so on. In those countries, because their diet is changing, some of the grain that we may be producing is going to be channeled through poultry and livestock and so on. So we're sharing that produce of grain with, with um, these creatures. And so the projection is that in general, between the two, anywhere from 70 to 100% increase in food demand that would be generated in the next 40 years. And I think as Roger said last night, that almost translates to say that we will have to learn how to produce as much food in the next four decades as we did since the beginning of civilization. That's a huge and tall order. But it becomes an even greater agenda because we have to do it because our sensitivity to the fragility of our ecosystem and the biodiversity around us have been much greater and elevated. And therefore, we may not want to do it in the way we had done in the past, where there were two ways of increasing food around the world. One was in the developed countries where science and technology had contributed greatly, so we were able to produce more food by using irrigation, fertilizers, insecticides, and so on. In the developing countries, much of any growth in food production that was done was done from horizontal increase, meaning that more and more land being brought to farming through deforestation and so on. Either way, our agricultural growth had had some footprints, and therefore this sensitivity and fragility of the ecosystem means that we will have to find new science and technology that is with heightened sensitivity to these issues that would allow us to produce more food, such as basically more crop per drop of water or whatever input that we're using. Today, um, uh, you know, the numbers would go up and down. I think it stands now at about 100, 850 million people are going hunger daily, but nearly a billion people. About 2.6 billion people live on less than $2 a day. And when you see the impact of the hunger and poverty around with such a large number of people around the world, I think we as people face huge and, and formidable challenges. Sorry. So when you look at the challenges uh, where, that we face to increase field, uh, uh, crop yields, um, the world is variable, variant, and that the soils of the world are not alike. 
If you look at really rich soils, there are very limited areas of the world that have it. Midwest of the United States is one of those. The Ukraines, uh, areas of Northern Europe, uh, but Northwestern Europe. And other than that, there many of the soils of the world have problems in which that they need amendment and to fix them. There are arguments pro and con about the use of fertilizer because there have been a higher level of fertilizer use in developed agriculture. But you would be surprised to learn that when there are rates of 100 kilograms per hectare or so used in other places in Africa, there is still under 10 kilograms per hectare on the average use of fertilizers. And so the effect of science and technology has not reached that. And the areas of the world that need these fertilizers don't have the access to fertilizer because they are so prohibitive, the price is. And the ecosystem concern, and by showing this uh, deforestation in the Brazilian uh, the, uh, Pantanal, that more and more acreage are being deforested in many places of the world to bring more new land uh, under cultivation. The statistics are alarming, and as you could read here, nearly 17 million hectares per year being lost through deforestation on an annual basis. Some six billion hectares of productive dry land turning into desert per year in more of the drier areas. An incredible number of losses of species around the world. But, but I want to focus on a few challenge areas and, and want us to go through those in trying to determine the areas of concern that we all have. And the so-called grand challenge areas that society is facing. One is climate change and impact. Yes, the greater area of climate change concerns is in the Arctic, but in many parts of the world, the effect of the change, whether you believe on it or not, whether the, you really believe there is climate change or not, the statistics is worth to look at. Not the statistics, but the data that is there. That for nearly 650,000 years, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration did not change significantly, even though there was a lot of fluctuations. Only since the last ice age, 7,000 years ago, the carbon dioxide concentration started shooting up. Impressive to me is when you would plot the data, as you could see here, on our use of non-renewable resources and land use, and correlate that with gas emissions, and correlate that with temperature change, they're almost identical. And model after model suggests that. These are data from about four different models that follow those changes, suggesting that the carbon dioxide concentration is real, and that is also associated with temperature change, suggesting to us that humanity had contributed significantly to this change. The other major challenge is the inequity in distribution among land haves and have-nots. What you realize is the opportunity that we have had in the past bringing more land under cultivation is not going to be available to us for, for too long. The statistics suggest that there is less than 15%, about 12% more land available that can be brought to cultivation, more arable land that can be brought to cultivation without deforestation. All others, lands that potentially could be cultivated are under badly needed uh, vegetation and forest. 
So the area of the world under crop can be doubled, but we can only do that if we brought more land from by cutting down trees. And much of the area of land that is left and that is available to us, the arable land available to us, are mostly in the developing countries, providing great opportunity for agriculture to expand, and particularly Africa. More than 50%, nearly 60% of this 12 more percent total land that is available for farming, that is available that can be brought to agriculture, is really in Africa. And thus, you've heard in the last few years about more and more businesses from China, India, and places like that, uh, the so-called land grab or land rush stories that you heard. The second, the, the other uh, grand challenge that we, fa we face is really water. Water has become the most important, more severe natural resource that we have not taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> evidences for a water problem as a result of uh, climate change, uh, this is uh, a, a winter rice field in, in China, a uh, picture in the New York Times, where government finally realized that they had to do something in terms of admitting and acknowledging the severe weather changes that have come their way. And as I said, 70% of the fresh water use around the world is in agriculture, which means that the most agriculturally developed nations of the world are the ones that are facing severe water issues. The withdrawal of water around the world is heavier in many of these agriculturally advanced countries. The water table is going down. A great example in North America is the Agulala Aquifer in the western part of the United States, all the way from Washington state to New Mexico, where pressure is being felt and agriculture pattern is, is, is beginning to change. And as this picture shows, you can compare it with, with agriculture, with industry, with municipal use, and so on. The 70% of that use is in agriculture. And so the available water areas are the areas, again, that have not been developed in agriculture. And this is the distribution of the withdrawal data. As you look at it, the most developed parts, North America, for example, is a heavy withdrawal of water uh, in the aquifer. And the other is associated with agriculture, again, is energy demand and use. Regardless of what kind of energy you're talking about, the trajectory of energy use has been high. And much of that energy, again, has been in the developed countries. Even though there are alternative sources of energy, 80% of the energy used so far is from fossil fuels. We've got a long way to go in being able to generate safe and reliable, renewable sources of energy. Again, similar to water, um, the energy demand and use distribution suggests that the areas of the world that are more developed, they happen to be the areas of the world with less population, using more of the energy sources available to us. And so the scare and the concern is the areas of the world like India and China with a higher population, as their way of life changes and their industries develop, the energy demand is going to be accelerated. A projection is at the, level, at the current use of energy, we're using, we're growing at 2% per year, doubling our energy demand every 37, every 40 years. And you can imagine that. And that's the push to generate new sources of energy, alternative sources of energy for use. The other challenge that we've been facing 
that contributes to some of the food shortages that are around the world is the complexities of international trade. The inequities that exist either in trade agreements, in tariffs, in, in restrictions, and so on. And vulnerability of the global food system as a result of this inequity that exists. Many of the developing countries that may have the produce don't have the standards, they don't meet the standards, and therefore they are not yet players in the global uh, world food market. And yet, because of hoarding and issues like that, they contribute to the once in, once in a while emerging food price crisis around the world. Another major challenge that have been discussed in the last couple of days is a huge loss in food. Losses from pre-harvest to post-harvest through processing, through storage, through transportation. And the losses there are, you know, interestingly, much of the loss, pre-harvest, at harvest, in the developed countries is almost zero. The machineries, thanks to the John Deere's of the world, the machineries that have been created are very efficient, whether it is grains being harvested or you know, the perishable crops, even tomatoes and vegetables and so on, harvesting systems have become very efficient. We don't lose. Even in transportation, we don't lose a lot. But in developing countries, there is huge loss in pre-harvest and post-harvest, all the way from losses due to not having good genetics and uh, uh, good products given to farmers, and then uh, not having machinery to harvest, not having storage systems to harvest, not having good transportation system. We lose a lot in many developing countries. As Roger indicated, much of the loss in the developed world is food. We have not been good stewards of the food that we have already prepared. And so either as a result of, mostly as a result of uh, legal concerns, in many residential halls, in hospitals, in hotels, and so on, food, lots and lots of food is being dumped and thrown away. And, and the total loss of those estimates is in the range of 40 to 50%. Even in India, a country that has really transformed itself from being a basket case in the 1960s to being a food basket today where they have sufficient food that they produce and they've got good storage systems where they store grain uh, for seasons to come. Estimates are nearly every year some 20% of the grain is damaged by insects in storage system. And so these are again losses that contribute to the shortage of food around the world and they could make up for the need to produce more food if those losses were taken care of. And, and the statistics, I think, have given you those. So I will say, you know, with, with those statements about the challenges we face, let me um, get to the topic that is assigned to me of focusing on smallholder farmers' issues. I think the urgency of the problem, and, and I don't want to point anything on, on to anyone, and hence, I took some pictures from my own native country, Ethiopia. Yes, I think changes are there in many developing countries. Positive developments are beginning to come. But look at this practice of farming in Ethiopia, a country that prides itself as one of the oldest civilizations. This is probably the way farming was practiced when man started sedentary farming in, in Africa. This is the way farming is practiced today. There is no evidence that science has contributed to the way of doing farming in any of this picture that you see. Or in the daily lives 
of poor rural families in, in Africa. And these are, again, my own people in Ethiopia. Whether it is fetching water or firewood or going to the market, there really isn't any sign that science has begun to come and affect their lives. So I think the fate of small farmers in poor nations in the 21st century face daunting challenges. It could also be a limitless possibility and potential. And just to pursue the line of reasoning that my colleague Roger had last night, when we talk about global food security, we're not only talking about the concerns of the poor and the hungry, but about whether or not we can sustainably feed the world for years to come. And in that line of thinking, it is important to recognize that global food security is a global problem, and therefore it needs global solutions means that the source of knowledge is not only one anymore, need not be one anymore. In the past, the more developed industrial world served as a source of knowledge in agriculture through other areas as well. But today, there are emerging nations, emerging powerhouses, Brazil, China, and India. Maybe some of these developing countries can follow. In the past, it used to be that the public institutions, such as Purdue University or uh, University of Illinois and this big um, uh, science research-based universities contributed much of the basic knowledge that is necessary to advance agriculture. And yet, the private sector came and exploited that and commercialized and helped the farmers help themselves. But anymore, the multinational companies have changed the game, and they have become huge investors, and now they have become the sources of modern technology and knowledge. And I suggest there is room to believe that many of these developing countries that can potentially merge the wisdom that is generated there through tradition, add on to it modern science and technology, they may contribute significantly to feeding the world down the road. You've seen the statistics, estimates of 500 million small farms around the world. At an average count of a family of four, that brings about two billion people. in the business of smallholder farming. That's about a third of humanity. They provide a lot of the food supply for Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Asia, the poorest regions of the world. There is little access to technology and markets for these people. But as I think I said this afternoon, smallholder farmers have shown great resilience in managing the unmanageable. The growing concern then is threats from coming from some of the changes or the great challenges, grand challenges we face. The climate I mentioned, the water crisis, energy demand, and then yet even with all of this recognition, expenditures and investments to agriculture, agricultural sciences have been on the decline. At the peak of foreign assistance, foreign technical assistance in 1979, 18% of the foreign aid went to technical assistance. By 2006, that had dropped down to less than 6%. It picked up a little, but it hasn't gone much up. Interestingly, when foreign technical assistance to research and technology development declined, internal investments in poor developing nations for those same services also declined. 
making more and more of developing countries ever reliant on technical assistance coming through social service units, through the NGOs. Many of these smallholder farmers, if they are going to be significant players, are going to need more beneficial policies and strategies from their governments and from donor countries that want to uh, change the game. There is more a need for land, water, and capital. And land is a very interesting option. Africa sits on a huge tracts of land available for farming, but many of the African farmers don't have land tenure. They don't have the incentives to do anything better to improve the soil. And more even more significantly, the governments don't recognize who is on the land and who is not. And the interesting development that arose as a result of the land rush to, in Africa is many of these lands were given out in contracts to business people in India, from India or China, only to find out that some of those lands are occupied by sedentary farmers that have lived on the land for a while. Their own governments didn't know that. And, these, and so basically, these farmers are out there, nobody paying attention to them, and no services provided to them, and occasionally becoming victim to these kinds of government accidents. And then in many developing, developed countries where agriculture advanced, agriculture advanced because there are these services, financial services available, whether they're credits and savings or insurance, access to markets and all these opportunities have not been there for smallholder farmers. So sustained government investment in support of research and development to market is one critical, many of these critical areas that, that are needed. The potential for small scale farmers, they can flourish as entrepreneurs, they can raise their income and profitability, they can be part of the solution instead of the problem but they will need the liberty to operate along the value chain from production, needed input and services and attention and public support at the time they produce the food in their storage system, in their market opportunities, in, the, in processing and so on. Meaning that a healthy environment needs to be created such that there is incentive and support to the farmers, but there is also incentive and support to developing the private sector that eventually would generate the jobs for employment so that the agro-industry complex that is necessary to develop for more opportunities for people need to be there. In as much as some criticize the agro-industry that developed in this country, what created the middle income in this country is really the agricultural revolution that started in the 1930s with hybrid corn and and the seed industry and the processing industry that came around bringing, bringing job opportunities to rural America. To create entrepreneurial small-scale small farmer operations, we need to build awareness among farmers of their immense value to society. We need to acknowledge them because they are contributing members of the society. We need to create farmer organizations with heightened community pride and discipline. We need governments that are committed to creating sustainable rural environments. We need to encourage the emergence of do well, do good private sector. We need to have NGOs and civil service organizations that are willing to work themselves out of the job. I think as huge as these problems are, I earnestly believe the solutions lie in science, technology, and innovation. We can change, increase the productivity, profitability, and the resilience of small-scale farmers through science and technology. Just a quick uh, example of the work that I had done um, in developing 
drought tolerant, striker resistant sorghum varieties and working with farm communities and linking them with market opportunities to advance the cause. Small job, but those are the kinds of things that are needed. Recognizing and acknowledging the role of those smallholder farmers as essential elements in a society to contribute to feeding the world. But that starts with a lot of capacity building, education, from whether it is primary and secondary. Education has expanded in Africa, don't get me wrong, since I was a child. There are more kids going to school. Yeah, that's wonderful. But on the other hand, the quality of education has gone down all the way from primary school to tertiary education. As a fourth grader, I knew a lot more than a high school graduate today in many African countries. Certainly as an eighth grader, I did. And you see this over and over again. In Ethiopia, where tertiary education has expanded, in the last seven years, seven years ago, there were four universities in Ethiopia. Today, there are 32 of them. Buildings have been put up. Students are coming in large numbers. But there are no faculty. The same number of faculty in the country. They're hiring everybody they can put their hands on. And the quality of education is, is really bad. The reason why that alarms me is anywhere in the world, wherever you go, leadership is usually cultivated among those with college education, right? By and large. It just bothers me to think 20 years from now, 30 years from now, where the leadership would come from at this level of education that is going on. So, in education, quality does matter because it is the skills that you develop and the foundations that you form by going to good schools such as these that you really have the foundation to function in a society and build upon it down the road. I won't bore you with research. This is something that you, you may not be thinking about. And, and the same with research needs to develop. Research that is, that is done in the country. My premise in all of this is technical assistance from outside is extremely valuable. Don't get me wrong. But nations are built by nationals. Foreigners don't build nations for other nations. To be able to do that, you need to have a well-educated society, young men and women, that would enter into all way, walks of life to develop that nation, whether it is public service, whether it's private sector, in all of these areas. And so in, 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 in education, in research, and as I'm saying here, there have been significant gains in education, as I mentioned, significant gains in research, but Africa's experience in technology transfer has been very dismal. The infrastructure, for various reasons, there have been chronic problems, immature institutions, very poor agents of change. You know, the, the local agents of change are not well trained. The outsiders that come in, they're there for a couple of years. By the time they learn about the problems of the country, they're already leaving and not really having something with traction on the ground. I like this cartoon. It shows of an African soccer player playing soccer on the planet Earth. The goal he's aiming at is on another planet. There is no a player, a mate playing with him or a coach but only a big referee blowing the whistle. That really exemplifies the, the range of technical assistance agenda that we had in Africa. Many people see figures like this 
In fact, uh, when I won the World Food Prize, I had a, a fortune of having an audience with m uh, Mr. Bill Gates. And uh, I showed you the picture that he saw of my work. And he asked me a very interesting question. He is an impatient man. He wants to see change very fast. And he said, if resources were not a problem, how much adoption do you predict for your work on sorghum, say in 10 or 15 years? I stopped, tried to be thoughtful, and said, I think I might have said about 15% or something like that. He said, why? If the technology works, if the problem is there, why wouldn't people want it? Because he comes from this field. If the technology is there, people want it, they would buy it. Cell phone technology in Africa is just going out of the ceiling. And I tried to tell him that these are two different worlds. But after that, I, I went back and looked at these slides. Those of you who are old enough would probably remember or know. This is a very interesting story. When hybrid corn first started in the United States, it took 25 years with all the knowledge and resourcefulness that existed in American agriculture. It took 25 years to move from about 0% to 95% adoption. The following slide, the next slide, the one with pink, is when hybrid sorghum started in the 1950s. It took five years to reach that number because the infrastructure was there, Knowledge was there. Farmers knew about it. Farmers knew what the benefit was. The agro industry is already there. Input services and credit services have already been in place. But human beings, particularly farmers, are cautious people. It takes time. And so I say the remarkable IT revolution should not create an illusion for the agriculture and biological sciences. Rate of adoption of new technology in a country is a function of experience and social realities. So how can we begin real change in African national development? I think in 2009, I testified in front of the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee about hunger in Africa. And I presented this case, and I want to share that with you quickly, and I think that's my last slide. And that is the pathway to Africa's pursuit of science-based development. Very simple thought on my side, but these are the things that I consider key elements for essential, that are essential for development. One is nations need to embrace science and technology for change, as drivers of change. But you can only build that science and technology or even adopt it if you have a local capacity. So you need to commit to education, to building local capacity from technicians to farmers to college students all the way up. That local capacity needs to be built up. To be able to do that, you also need to build the uh, uh, institutions around, around it. You need to ignite the entrepreneurial spirit and value because when it works well, public-private partnership is really a magical formula for development. You need to promote public-private partnership, policymakers that support and facilitate innovations and market support for services. But I think to be able to do that, you need to have executive leadership with a resolve and commitment to nation building. This picture was taken when the World Food Prize sent me to get some footage from places where, place where I was born, places where I went to school. 
And the photographer that went with me apparently had taken a picture of me with kids from my neighborhood. I didn't even remember the picture. But after he, we got back, he printed the picture and gave it to me. That picture has become a favorite picture of mine. I often end my talks with that. I've got a, a big print of that in my office on my desk. What it reminds me is I was one of these kids. Through perseverance and hard work and the grace of God, I'm here. Who says one or two or three or four of this kids would not achieve that? I have to have a hope. Thank you very much.